Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the Transportation Element Workshop. We will get started in a bit as people start to come into the Zoom room. All right, um, let's get started. Good evening, everyone. Um, I know my screen is starting to show up, but I'll at least introduce myself while we're waiting for the screen to work. My name is Tam Tran, and I work at the San Francisco Planning Department. And um, let me stop sharing and try to reshare again because the screen is not working. Okay, again, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Tam Tran. I work at the San Francisco Planning Department and we are delighted that you have joined us tonight to hear more about the transportation element. And I, I see that my screen is still not working. Um, hmm. Okay, it's slowly coming on. Okay. Let's go ahead and continue and try to work with the technology as we can. Um, before we dive in to talk about the transportation element and the planning department's update of the element, I'd like to make some important points for our time together. Our workshops are welcome to everyone. And in turn, we ask and expect that you also be welcoming and respectful of your fellow participants. Tonight is both an opportunity and a safe space for all of us to learn from each other. And my colleagues will be monitoring the audio, video, and chat. Any type of inappropriate behavior will not be tolerated. We are recording this presentation, which is being live streamed on our YouTube page. If you'd like to chat, please feel free to do so using the chat button on the bottom of your screen. The agenda for tonight is as follows. You know, we're in the midst of the welcome and orientation. We'll hear from our guest speaker, Jeff Tumlin, and we'll have an overview of the transportation element before we, we go into breakout groups. We'll be asking for your input. After these breakout group discussions, we'll gather back as a larger group and hear about what each of our fellow participants discussed about in their groups. And then I'll be giving a quick overview of what's next, what you can expect for what's coming next for the transportation element. So we're gonna kick things off with a poll. 
Ryan, if you can start the poll, please. Ryan is our Zoom master tonight. Um, please take a moment to fill out these three questions because we want to know what you know about the transportation element. We want to find out who's in the room and also find out what you're most excited about for tonight's session. And we'll give you about a minute to fill out the poll. Okay, so about three quarters of you have filled it out, the other 25%, um, please finish up. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. So, um, for people, for the first question, in terms of people's knowledge about the transportation element, so it looks like more than half of you have some familiarity with it, and a quarter of you have heard about it, and 25th, 20, a fifth of you have heard it for the first time tonight, and we have a, a little percentage that knows it very, very well. So that's great to hear. Um, in terms of who's in the room, most folks are from members of the general public. We have some community leaders as well as agency staff, we have researchers and business a developer and business leader. And in terms of what people are interested in hearing about tonight, wow, um, more than two thirds to learn more about the transportation element. And a fifth of you are looking forward to hearing from Jeff and as well as giving feedback during our breakout rooms. This is great because it's what we wanna hear from you and learning how to get more involved in the transportation element of almost 50% of you. So thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on the poll. So next up is our guest speaker, Jeffrey Tumlin, who is the director of the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. As many of you know, SFMTA plans, builds, operates, and manages the city's transportation network and Jeffrey Tumlin has been its director since 2019. I don't know what other trial by fire, by fire is more difficult than being a city leader of a system that touches everyone every day during a pandemic. We're really glad that Jeffrey can join us tonight. And after we hear from him, there will be a Q&A session. So if you have any questions for him, please feel free to put them in the chat button. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Jeffrey Tumlin. Thanks, Tam. Um, so uh, Tam asked me to speak on a couple of topics this evening. First of all, uh, how did I get into transportation? Why do I care about it? Um, also the ways in which um, the pandemic has changed our approach to transportation uh, and what we think about uh, recovery. Uh, and finally, thoughts and advice about uh, how to incorporate all of our learnings into the general plan. So this is gonna be a little, um, Informal and rambly, Tam, please feel free to interrupt me, uh, particularly if I go too long, uh, because I wanna make sure that people have time uh, to ask the questions. Um, so first of all, um, let me start uh, about how I got into transportation. So uh, 150 years ago, back in the 80s when I was in college, uh, a combination of um, some really hot guys and some really mean pre-med students resulted in me uh, being really miserable in both my calculus and uh, organic chemistry classes and caused a sort of crisis of what on earth I was doing studying in college. And in a fit of irrational exuberance, um, I changed my major from biochemistry to urban studies. 
Uh, it was the year that the um, uh, United Nations had come out with the Brundtland Report, which really coined the term sustainability for the first time. And I wanted to apply the learnings uh, from um, other fields about what sustainability meant in terms of human habitat. Fast forward four years from then, and I was, oh, I don't know, about three weeks away from having to move back into my car, living on Division Street in San Francisco, um, when the boss of a summer internship that I'd had called me up um, and asked me uh, to come help her manage the Stanford University parking system, which was something I had no interest in whatsoever, uh, but was not otherwise going to eat or be able to pay my rent. Um, so I decided to sign up with that and ignore my job description uh, and, and, and keep working until they fired me and then go off to graduate school. And it ended up being a very strange time in Stanford's history because uh, the university was still recover, recovering from the Loma created earthquake uh, in which um, they lost a third of their campus buildings. They lost a third of the endowment in the junk bond collapse of the early 90s. Uh, and they'd signed a development agreement with Santa Clara County that effectively allowed the university unlimited growth um, provided it kept its peak period auto trips capped at 1989 levels. Uh, and I was given the task of implementing that agreement, not knowing at the time um, that uh, I was being set up as the fall guy um, because nobody thought that that was possible. Um, but I was an arrogant 20 something year old at the time uh, and decided to do it and learned an awful lot. Um, I learned among other things that there is no better or faster way to achieve pretty much any goal in cities than through transportation. We are the primary driver of public health outcomes. Uh, if people can get 10,000 steps a day, they don't need nearly as much medical treatment. And on the other hand, uh, the most dangerous thing that almost any of us ever do is drive in a car or walk or bike on city streets. There is no better way of or faster way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, air pollutants, or water pollutants. Transportation is by far the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions here in San Francisco and in California, and the fastest way to implement uh, reductions in greenhouse gases. Uh, because the motor vehicle fleet changes over about every decade, whereas buildings, uh, most of them last well over 50 years, um, we're the opportunity to make a big, rapid change, and also the sort of changes where the co-benefits of decarbonization outweigh the primary benefits from congestion reduction. We're also a primary driver of economies. Uh, cities exist because of um, economic proximity and the way to create real estate value is through transportation investments. This has been true for thousands of years uh, and we will be a primary driver in San Francisco's economic recovery from COVID. But more importantly, what transportation does is we create opportunity. Uh, and the choices we make about where we invest and how we invest has a profound impact on who gets what opportunity. So there is no better way for um, not only delivering opportunity to people who need it the most, but also for correcting for the fact that my industry has the worst possible record in terms of stripping opportunity away, particularly from people of color, but also from women and children and disabled people uh, and other people uh, with economic disadvantages. Uh, back in the battle days of redevelopment, your freeway project got extra points and extra federal funding if it removed blight. Blight, of course, being defined um, as Black or Asian or Hispanic ownership, but particularly Black ownership. And the history here in San Francisco is very clear about the ways we have used public funds in transportation to destroy Black wealth. And we have an enormous amount of work to do in order to correct for those past sins, as well as to use our future transportation investments in order to prioritize opportunity for the people with the fewest choices. Um, so back, uh, oh, I'm taking too much time. Let me, let me talk really quickly about um, the pandemic. Um, so one of the challenges in all government agencies in California is that our expenses rise with the cost of living. 
So our expenses are driven entirely by labor and we need to provide a living wage to our workforce. Um, working for the SFMTA used to be a path to middle-class existence. It isn't any longer, despite our efforts to keep pace with wages. Meanwhile, our revenues um, are either flat or declining or at best grow with inflation. And so every year we fall behind about two to 4%. Every year we're able to deliver less and less service. And for decades, the SFMTA has tried to paper over these losses by avoiding uh, investing in maintenance in order to continue to provide service that we fundamentally can't afford. So uh, before the pandemic, we were running a $50 million annual structural deficit. We're now running, we expect, even after recovery, about $150 million annual structural deficit. And so we have no path to recovery without seeking additional ongoing sustained operating revenues and operating revenues that rise each year with the cost of living because that's how our, uh, our expenses rise. So this is really critical. Um, and so the things that we need from a new general plan include real clarity about what the city's values are when it comes to transportation. But more importantly, how do we make the transportation system more efficient and more equitable? We are no longer, no longer demolishing neighborhoods in order to widen streets in order to move more cars. So our task as the city grows is always, how do we make the most space efficient use of our limited street rights of way in order to not just move people and goods, but to deliver on all the other values that, we're, that we care about, whether it's equity or um, pollution reduction or economic um, development. How do we take our limited amount of space and allocate it in order to best serve the public good? And so this means prioritizing the most space efficient modes of transportation. Driving is super convenient. I love driving, but I also know that when I drive, I take up more than 10 times as much roadway space as I do when I walk or bike or take commuting. Um, and that's not to say we, we should ban cars. It is to say that we need to look at the mobility system like a soundboard and to make adjustments to every single mode of transportation in order to optimize, again, the public right of way for the public good. And so in order to do that, not only do I need clarity about values in the general plan, I also need clarity about priorities and um, uh, how to address difficult trade-offs. Uh, uh, the, one of the big problems with the current transportation element of the general plan is it is a very, very long list of wants. It is not a clear assessment of needs nor how to make the tough call when you don't have enough roadway width in order to be everything to everyone. So to what degree should we shrink the parking supply in order to achieve our other goals like a protected bikeway network? And does that answer that question vary depending upon context? Is it easier to strip away parking in a wealthy neighborhood where people have more opportunities to get around without a car? Uh, is it harder to strip away parking in a neighborhood commercial district where merchants are highly dependent upon cars? Um, how do we make those tough trade-off decisions across many, many objectives um, in all sorts of different contexts? So I think I'm probably at time. I could ramble on for another hour, um, but why don't we pause now and Tam, uh, we can take some questions. Yeah, no, the point, well, you actually really set up my, my presentation really well. The point about values, trade-offs and priorities, you know, and how do we make all these decisions to reach the goals we have given our different needs? Um, I have some questions for you, but there's so many in the chat for you that I'm going to go straight to the chat. Um, there was one question about transit first, and a participant asked, we've had a transit first policy for several decades, but every improvement seems to be incremental, and whenever parking is removed, it becomes a huge battle. So the question is, what can we do to get a full citywide protected bike lane network and transit only lanes in keeping with the transit first policy? Um, so that's a great question. It's, I think a useful uh, role for the general plan is actually to find that network and to make the modal trade-offs um, from the get-go. Um, we really need a systemic approach to solving these problems rather than a block by block or parking space by parking space approach. And we need, not, we need that not only on the, you know, for the, the bike and scooter and wheelchair network, we need that for the transit network 
um, as well. So it's my goal that the transportation element of the general plan um, define a citywide network where everyone and literally everyone will feel safe taking themselves or their eight-year-old or their grandmother on a bike or a skateboard or a scooter or in a wheelchair from their neighborhood to any other neighborhood in San Francisco. Similarly, we need to define a transit network um, where we can operate transit every five minutes all day long and those buses and trains are never stuck in congestion and only have to stop at a red light to, to let another bus uh, cross in front of them. Um, these are easy choices that we can make and they're best done, again, at the systemic level rather than you know, one fight to the, to the next because we don't have time. Um, this city will not be survivable unless we quickly decarbonize the transportation sector. So I hear you about the five minute network and making a network a network of buses that only stop to drop off, drop off and pick up people. What about competition from ride hills or other types of technologies? You know, how can we make transit faster, more attractive to people who might be inclined to take those other types of modes? So we know from case studies all over the world that the recipe for successful transit is really straightforward. You need service that is fast and frequent and reliable uh, and offers a you know, reasonable quality. If you have those elements, um, people take transit in droves. We as humans make our decisions uh, based on a really limited number of factors. So first of all, like it needs to be, there needs to be a basic level of safety in a sort of, uh, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs sort of way. But the real factor once you achieve the basics is that we all place a very high value on our time. And that is true actually, particularly of low income people um, who are holding multiple jobs. And so if we can time advantage the most space efficient mode of transportation, um, we can achieve a lot. But the other factor of course is money. Um, and one of the concerns that we have is uh, for example, with Uber and Lyft, but particularly with autonomous vehicles, um, autonomous vehicles are basically Uber and Lyft, but at a lower price point. Um, and while they are incredibly convenient, they're also extremely space inefficient. So taking Uber and Lyft means you're consuming one and a half times as much roadway space as you do if you drive alone, because about half of Uber and Lyft driving is zero passenger travel. It's, it's the driver you know, cruising around looking for uh, an occupant. We're very concerned about a far worse upset of outcomes with autonomous vehicles. And it's why we're working very closely with the California Public Utilities Commission and the Buttigieg administration to make sure that municipalities have the right tools in order to manage the public right of way for the public good, making sure that the most space efficient mode of transportation is also the cheapest and the fastest. Great. Um... Thanks. I, I know we only have YouTube 625, but those are really great remarks and very pertinent responses to questions, great, great questions we had. So Director Tumlin, thank you again for joining us. We appreciate your time and your work. My pleasure. Good luck uh, writing the transportation element. We're coming, forward We're to, coming to you for it. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, Thanks to folks who contributed questions for the chat. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Um, such is the nature of having someone's time for such a short amount of time. So let's start talking about the transportation element. And Selena, if you can, please share the PowerPoint. Um, I've, I've asked someone else to do that because I am unable to work on mine. So we are gonna talk about the transportation element and the current one was adopted in 1995, and we're looking at updating it. And so before I start talking about the element, I wanna to talk to you about the general plan. Next slide, please. Um, the San Francisco general plan really covers how we grow and develop as a city. It influences where we live, work, how we move around, and it has many components, as you see on the screen here. 
So each of these components or elements make up almost all of the functions or services provided in a city. And they do this individually as well as in connection with each other. Um, advance. Also, there are areas that affect all of the elements, racial equity, environmental justice, and climate resilience. So those are absolutely critical in getting us to become a more equitable, prosperous city. So all of those items will be covered in the, all the elements. So let's talk about transportation. Um, next slide, please. So the, the transportation element will include policies and priorities for the safe, sustainable, and equitable movement of people and goods, just what Jeff talked about. And I really wanna emphasize people because when we think about transportation, I think most of us tend to think about how we get around, the means we use to get around, bus, bike, car, skateboard, or, or whatever, and, and that's fine. But what we'd like to invite you to do is to think about people, the people who use these means to get around. And that could be you, your family, your neighbors, your fellow San Franciscans. Um, next slide, please. You know, we share our streets and sidewalks with people who have different abilities, financial means, life situations. And no matter what the combination of these factors are, everyone deserves the right. They should be able to move around safely and efficiently in San Francisco. Goods are also important. Um, things like food, medicine, all the necessities that get delivered to people to use. Goods are also things that business owners need so that they can run their businesses employ workers and serve customers. So our individual well-being, our collective well-being, and the economic prosperity of the city is really tied into, into moving people and moving goods safely and efficiently. Decisions related to this will be based on policies and priorities in the transportation element. And what do I mean by policies? Next slide, please. So a policy is a statement of action about what we want to do or how to make decisions to help us achieve our goals. And here are some example policies in our existing transportation element. We have policies related to community engagement. We have policies related to pedestrian safety, transit, parking, freeways, water transportation. It's, it's quite a comprehensive element. Um, next slide. This slide shows how policies have been used for transportation projects in the city. An example is Car Free Market Street. The transportation element gave the city legal authority to prohibit private vehicles on Market Street. And this came straight from the state's vehicle code that allows car free streets because it's specified in the transportation element. We're looking at doing something similar for slow streets. And this is a temporary emergency measure that was put on during the pandemic. And there've been calls to make it permanent. And so we're looking at policies in the transportation element to see if we can legislate that. So why do we need a new transportation element? It looks like the current one has some pretty useful policies in it, as you can see from these two examples. Except that it was adopted in 1995. And a few things have changed since 1995. Next slide. Um, we have a, had a increase in the number of people who live and work in San Francisco since 1995. The number of options of how to get around has also grown. Technology has dramatically altered how we live and will continue to do so. Climate change. Climate change was a distinct possibility in 1995, and now it's here, it's, it's real. So see, these are some of the things that have changed since 1995. And let me talk for a moment about what has not changed since 1995. Next slide. The racism that has been part of our policies, laws, and actions, including those of the planning department, 
has been a part of our history and really continues today. Next slide. This, these kind of policies have resulted in terrible, even deadly outcomes for people of color and low income communities. If we are to meet our aspirations of being in an equitable, inclusive city, because I think San Franciscans like to think of themselves as being equitable and inclusive, but if we are to really meet those aspirations, this has to change. For transportation, policies are needed to help people of color and low income households travel safely, efficiently, affordably, so they can access opportunity, schools, jobs, services, amenities, and so forth. Next slide, please. We also have city goals related to safety and climate action. These goals are to eliminate deaths and severe injuries caused by traffic collisions. And we also have goals related to having 80% of our trips be taken on bike, walking, or by transit sustainable modes by 2030. Next slide. How will, we, how will we meet our equity goals, our equity aspirations, our safety goals, and our climate goals in a way that balances our different needs? What kind of trade-offs are we going to make as individuals and communities so that we can become a city of choice? Next slide. And a city of choice is a place where individuals and families choose to live here because they have safe, efficient access to jobs and opportunity. So how do we do that? Well, it really starts with goals and principles, which is where we are very much interested in hearing your feedback. And next slide. So my colleagues and I are part of a program called Connect SF, where we are looking at long range projects and policies to help meet San Francisco's transportation needs. And part of this process included developing a vision and goals for our work. Next slide. We developed the vision and goals with individuals, community-based organizations, businesses, people like you to develop, you know, we worked with them to develop this vision and goals together. And we also had a task force of over a hundred people who guided our work. And it's great to see some of these task force members here tonight. Next slide. The goals we developed are on this following slide. And for the transportation element, my colleagues and I really wanted a framework, a reference point, highly focused on transportation that we can refer to as we develop policies for the transportation element. For example, racial and social equity are very important, but how does transportation support that? Um, we also want to be more explicit about land use. Land use, which is how we use space, for example, where jobs and homes are located, how can we tie land use and transportation so they support and complement each other. Next slide, please. So we came up with these 10 draft guiding principles and we want to get your feedback on them. And so when you go out your breakout groups, you will be asked for your feedback on them and I'll be doing a quick demo on how to do that. Um, next slide. This is the point in the presentation where I ask people or I'll let people watching on YouTube know that we are in the live stream because we'll be entering breakout groups. So if you're watching on YouTube, thank you for watching. And for the rest of you, here's what you can expect when you get into your small groups or breakout groups. Next slide. So first remember that our time together is welcoming, respectful, and inclusive. We wanna hear from all of you to the extent that you're comfortable speaking or putting your thoughts into the chat. Next slide. We'll be using 